Hello and welcome to World Bank Live. I'm Paul Blake. Over the past three months, the World Bank Group has mounted the fastest crisis response in its history, quickly making available up to $160 billion over 15 months, as well as technical assistance to developing countries as they braced for, are responding to, and prepare to recover from the coronavirus pandemic. The World Bank is now financing emergency operations in over 100 countries, home to 70% of the global population. Let's take a quick look at the global scale of the World Bank's response. To get his assessment of the road ahead and the risks and opportunities for developing countries as they look towards recovery, I'm very happy to welcome World Bank Group President David Malpass to World Bank Live. David, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, happy to be on. It's a good topic. Well, sir, let's just jump right into it. Much of the world's attention so far has rightly been focused on the health crisis and the immediate response to that. But as countries begin to, to relax some of those restrictions, those lockdowns, a lot of the focus is going to be turning towards rebuilding and recovery. What will be your priorities and, and the focus areas for the World Bank Group as we move forward here? It'll be very important that the, the, the private sector be maintained, the government sectors be improved, uh, and also that we have a matching of what the, where the World Bank can help countries uh, and, and, and where they can actually make progress. So there's this combination of available resources and uh, things that the countries want to do. We want to be responsive to the country's needs, but also to make as much progress as we can. When I talk about the World Bank, I'm also talking and mostly about IDA, the International Development Association, which is the part of the World Bank that works with the poorest countries. Uh, and so both of those, uh, the, the World Bank entity is working as a combined group along with IFC in order to create a, a better recovery, a stronger recovery for as many countries as we can really bringing all the different institutions together, bringing all that force to bear to support developing countries as they recover. I, you know, I know you believe that the developing countries will be hardest hit by the downturn that, that, could, that, that is likely to result from the pandemic. Help me and, and the audience understand this a little bit further. Why does the bank, why do you think they are particularly vulnerable in this period ahead? It's a double impact. They're vulnerable to the pandemic, to COVID-19 itself, and people are dying in the countries. But then this added problem is they just don't have the resources uh, capacity in order to, to protect their economies. What we've seen in the advanced countries is huge amounts of borrowing and spending uh, in order to maintain jobs, protect jobs, and also give, give a social safety net. We can do some of that in the developing world, but we can't match the unemployment insurance that people get in, in the advanced economies, for example. So what we are trying to do is create programs that are as helpful as possible uh, to, the, to the countries. And this means tailoring the programs uh, to different countries. Some of the countries have uh, the ability uh, to pass cash to, to people, to poor people through through a safety net that's that's similar to what what uh, advanced countries have. So in those cases, we can push we can put money through those systems and it really keeps people out of extreme poverty. Uh, and that's very valuable to their children, to education, that they can pay a little bit of money so that their children can go to school or be transported to school or or be spared in the in the fields. Uh, that that's critical to the 
to the family's future. Uh, food, food resources are a critical part of this problem, and uh, uh, money can help, uh, but also uh, food products for the animals. Uh, that's a critical part of the East Africa problem. So what I'm, what I'm conveying is there needs to be variation uh, across countries to meet the needs, the, the, the urgent needs that people are having as the world goes into this deep recession. And if I'm, if I'm understanding you correctly, it's a lot of looking at the individual needs of those countries and tailoring the response for those countries to make sure they're, they're getting an effective response that they need. That, that's exactly right. And as we think about the future, if you think about three years from now, what you would like to have is some areas where countries have been able to make progress uh, in ways that uh, that allows, uh, allows them to have stronger growth. A an example of that is uh, uh, advanced uh, advancements uh, that are being made in digital access. One of the problems that poor countries have is just being cut off, that people live in rural areas, they don't have broadband. They, they, in some cases, many cases, don't have electricity or 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 water that's clean enough to drink. And so, as as we look to the other side of this, uh, I think there's a way to make progress on on uh, advancing the the digital services that people have available, so they can get access to information. That's a starting point for farmers to do a better job, for uh, people to learn skills. One of the big things that people can do now, and the bank has big programs in, is the skills learning at the basic level so that people are able to have jobs in the future. So that's something that we have, uh, we're, 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 we're making available programs uh, that will help people uh, get, the, get access to education or to skills uh, that will help them uh, when there's a recovery. And on a more sort of abstract kind of overview economic level, my, my understanding is that, you know, a faster recovery will require a return to growth. What are some of the key areas for the bank and, and your priorities for supporting and promoting that return to growth? Uh, a starting point is maintaining uh, the, the some financial uh, capacity within the countries. Uh, and that, that means uh, the the countries w w w one big problem is countries have been cut off from access to uh, global financial markets and so there's been a sudden change in their ability to roll over their debt borrow their debt so what one uh, w so we're doing multiple things in that area one is, uh, sizable new resources from the World Bank Group. We're, we're, we're providing large net positive flows to many countries. The IMF is uh, adding resources and the other multilateral development banks are doing that. And then another part of this is the is a debt moratorium. M many of the poorest countries had uh, taken on large debt burdens that were coming due. They were having to pay interest and principal on their, on their debt. And so I called for a moratorium on that and Kristalina Georgieva of the IMF IMF uh, joined me in, in March, and the G20 endorsed this uh, this approach. And so what? And it took effect on May one. So the countries are saving billions of dollars, uh, and will be over the summer and uh, over over the middle of the year and into into late 2020 uh, on debt service that they don't have to pay. Uh, we're the, the, you know there's lots of details in this, uh, but the key the key issue is to uh, have more resources available from donors, from uh, capital markets where we, the World Bank, borrows a lot of money and passes it on to the poorer countries, uh, and then from this moratorium. So that's one set of uh, tasks. And then the other set of tasks is to maintain an economy so that it's ready to have growth when, when, the, when the developed world starts growing again. That means farmers uh, able to have seeds for their crops. One of the things we're doing in East Africa, it, which has been hard hit by the locust crisis, is setting the stage or creating the foundation 
so that the farmers that have lost their entire crop uh, will be able to replant uh, and create a new crop into the future. So that that allows some maintenance of the agriculture system and also the livestock system, which is such a key part of, uh, of developing countries. Uh, and then the private sector itself, that means the basic uh, uh, the basic building blocks so that companies who are starting up are able to import goods and export goods uh, into their neighbors and into the global markets. Those are all steps. IFC, the International Finance Corporation, has been instrumental in creating trade finance. They have 300 programs uh, or have had 300 inquiries that turn into uh, programs where they lend companies money for a very short period of time to finance imports. And that program already has had $1.4 billion of, uh, of, uh, of involvement, of engagement with countries in order to maintain the flow of goods uh, into and out of uh, poor countries. That And uh, we think as much as half of that is to what we call FCV countries, countries that face fragility, conflict, and violence. So those are some of the poorest countries, often in sub-Saharan Africa, but around the world. Uh, and so that gives you a sense of the breadth of the program. So to put it in perspective, we started with the healthcare crisis. That was a hundred programs starting in mid-March that we were able to set up a, a programs in a hundred different countries that would address the immediate health crisis and provide things like personal protective equipment. But now, and now we've, we're, we're implementing that uh, and it, it's a big challenge. It involves a lot of people at the bank, but we're moving to the, to the next stage of designing programs that will maintain maintain the economies uh, and and be ready as a recovery takes hold, we hope in the second half of 2020. And I want to talk to you, you mentioned the IFC there, I want to talk to you more about that. But let's just pause for a moment and take the opportunity to welcome people who are tuning in from around the world. We appreciate everyone who is joining us here on World Bank Live. As many know, over the past few months, we've been taking stock of the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on just about every aspect of economic development. Today, that effort continues as we've got an overview of the World Bank's work and, a, and its response to the crisis. We're also getting a preview of what a strong economic recovery will look like. And to do that, we have World Bank Group President David Malpass joining us on the line, sharing his thoughts on the road ahead. David, before the break, we were talking about some of these different aspects of the recovery. And one of the key areas that the bank will be you know, uh, supporting to promote economic growth um, as the pandemic is affecting that that the global economy, we're seeing many companies struggling and, and workers losing their jobs right across the world. You mentioned before the IFC, for folks who are, who are just tuning in who might not be aware, that's the International Finance Corporation. That's the part of the bank that supports the private sector in developing countries. Um, it's deploying an $8 billion package in fast track financing as a part of its response to this crisis, as part of the World Bank Group's response to this crisis, what are some of the priorities for that $8 billion package and, and how is it addressing the employment situation in the developing countries? It, it varies in different countries. So some countries have been completely cut off from financial markets abroad and those, for example, from banks. Uh, and those were important. It, and we talked earlier about the trade finance side of what IFC does. Uh, and that's very important because it's fast acting. The, you, can, you can borrow money in order to buy goods to bring them into your country. And also you can you can export uh, and get the get the uh, get the the uh, money from the export more quickly than maybe the buyer could could supply. And so that finances a fast part of the recovery and IFC is in the middle of that. Uh, and it's been particularly important because in, during this uh, global recession, the, the financial markets have frozen up. Uh, and so this provides liquidity. So that's one aspect. Another aspect is working capital. So smaller businesses don't, do, and many even mid-sized bigger businesses don't have access to a bank that will lend to them 
while they build up uh, accounts receivable, while they build up an inventory. Let's say you want to buy something in a country, you need to hold inventory so people will come in and buy it and can see the product. That costs money, and so the IFC can be can help with that, and that's another chunk of the resources. And it's a little bit different country by country in terms of the legal structure. So that's that creates challenges, but they're moving uh, very quickly on that. And then one other aspect that I'll mention is the the uh, the ability to uh, create to to buy equipment for a company. Let's say you have a great idea for a company, and you know people are going to buy it, but it takes some degree of equipment. Maybe it's for small manufacturing. So you need a lathe or you need a sewing machine or you need uh, a wheelbarrow for a construction project. Each of those uh, is hard. If, if In very poor countries, it's just hard for people to buy those. So the IFC can, uh, can, can create the leasing uh, opportunities, the uh, equipment purchasing opportunities that helps businesses get started. And promoting the creation of businesses and, and allowing people to start businesses. Now, I think if I'm not mistaken, earlier in the program, you mentioned trade. I know that's another big priority for you, for the World Bank, for the IFC, uh, you know, keeping trade flowing. Can you explain that to us a little bit more and, and what are some of the actions that can help in this area? And, and for those of us who might not understand some of the finer details here, why, why are developing countries particularly vulnerable to trade disruptions? They are. Uh, the, the, that's because uh, the, the advanced economies have more money uh, and they can buy things at a higher price. And so it's, it's quite an quite a, uh, important avenue of development for the developing countries to be able to sell into global markets. But I want to step back for a minute. Um, the, the, we know from human history that people benefit when they specialize. And so one of the most important parts of trade and commerce is trading with your neighbor. I'm good at doing something, my neighbor, she's good at doing something, and we can trade goods and, and it's trade goods and services and develop a better town and then a better county, and then a better state, and then a better nation. Uh, and then very soon nations want to trade with each other because some they're better at some things than other things. And so the, the it, it turns out that one of the most important things is cross-border trade, is, is the ability to, to uh, have similar standards or transparent standards that allow you to trade across a, a boundary. Uh, and so we work a lot on, and the, the, this area is called trade facilitation. So it means just that you try to facilitate or make it easier for people to trade with each other by having some light regulatory policy that 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 addresses safety, that addresses standards, so that you know what you're buying. Uh, and so that's that's a, a chunk of the work that the that the bank does. Uh, and it turns out to be not that expensive and very beneficial when it can be accomplished. Uh, so I I wanted to tell you about that. But then, then as we come to the uh, to more global markets, uh, this gets into uh, the ability of developing countries to move up the value chain. You start by making things that are the most basic raw materials, and that might be, for example, a coffee bean or a peanut uh, in the fields or a uh, other kinds of crops that you know have market value, uh, but all, all you can do at this point is produce it and sell it to someone else and then it gets shipped abroad. So as as we as we think about what countries can do to get ready for faster growth, uh, they can add value. Maybe they differentiate their coffee from someone else's coffee. So they put a brand on it so that people want to buy it as a specialty product. There are all sorts of different ways that countries can uh, make an advance. And this I, I'll, I'll make a point here about the importance of the flexibility of an economy and the ability to uh, allocate resources or allow 
their their country to allocate resources to things that are going to be profitable down the line. So one of the biggest things we can do during the crisis is identify areas where countries can uh, build their their flexibility uh, and uh, create capacity for growth in the future. And those explanations are super, super helpful there. Let's just take another moment, David, to, to pause and welcome everyone who's been tuning in from around the world. You're with World Bank Live, and we're continuing to take stock of the coronavirus pandemic's impact on global economics and development. Today, we're joined by World, Ga world Bank Group President David Malpass. He's sharing his thoughts on the crisis response and what the road to a strong and sustainable recovery will look like. If you're just joining us, you can watch, you can catch up on this episode and all the other episodes from our COVID-19 live series. If you head on over to live.worldbank.org later today, the, this will be up there. Uh, the other episodes are up there. But David, I want to turn back to you now. You know, I know another big priority of yours is sustainable use of debt. I've heard in the past about debt transparency and, and other responsible uses of debt. The World Bank you know, has warned about the level of debt that some of the poorest, some of the, the developing countries are holding even before this crisis began. My question for you is, is, has this crisis made that situation worse? Has the coronavirus pandemic increased the threat of unsustainable debt? Uh, one problem is that the governments of developing countries are seeing their revenues go down a lot. That's their tax revenues and their revenues from tariffs, from from trade, for example. Uh, and, and so what that means is whatever level of debt they had prior to the crisis is more burdensome. Uh, so we're addressing that with by providing more resources, by the moratorium on payments uh, that uh, uh, that we talked about earlier. Uh, the, the, the G20 countries, the biggest uh, countries, have been generous in saying that the poorest countries don't need to pay them back for their official uh, for their official debt. Uh, that that saves money for the developing country, but also means that new investments have some breathing room in order to uh, in order to grow going forward. So that that's an important step, the, the debt sustainability. Another part of this is the transparency of both the debt and the investment that countries make. The, a, the, a, I'll phrase it as a problem, but I think we're, we're making progress. The problem is when governments enter into contracts that are not transparent, it's hard to, it's hard to know whether they've been getting a good deal, uh, whether it's going to work for the people of the country. So it's a better system to have transparency. That way, the people of the country are able to see uh, what the what the commitments are that their governments are making, and also what they're getting for their the, for the money that they're going to be paying back to the to the lender. And so we've been strongly encouraging a more transparent uh, 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 process for both the debt and the investments that countries make, poor, uh, countries around the world. Uh, every stage of development, I think, can benefit from transparency. And the, the positive side of this is that way you can attract more investment and higher quality investment. If you have that transparency at the base, uh, then investors want to come in and projects start being proposed that make more sense for the people of the country. Uh, and so that's that's been a, a strong uh, focus of the bank, and we'll continue that over the next year, over the next two years. And the countries are participating, but I don't want to underestimate the difficulty of this. You know, there's a lot of inertia in the system, and it's hard to break out of that. Countries are used to entering contracts, and the lenders like it to have these non-transparent contracts. So one of the things we're trying to do is break through that and convince both sides that it's going to be better for them, more in their interest, if there can be more transparency within the system. Letting people get a view of some of the terms around some of these uh, loans and, and deals that, that their governments are making. I just, as we wrap up here, looking for a silver lining, a lot of people look at the, the the pandemic and the crisis and the recovery that will come as an opportunity to, to quote unquote, build back better. 
And, and I think what they mean by that is that the decisions and the investments that countries make now and, and will make here in the, in the short term could result in a more resilient and sustainable sort of foundation that will help those countries sort of held, you know, uh, uh, hold off future crises or, or, or protect themselves from somewhat from future crises. Where do you and the, and the bank see some, of op some opportunities to that end? This is my favorite topic because it points to the future, a better future where people can uh, have, have more confidence in what their families will be experiencing. One part of that is the, is the, the environment itself. So the pure meaning of sustainable is that you can keep doing it year after year without running out of resources, your country's natural resources, without using up global public goods. For example, polluting the ocean uh, means that uh, that, uh, that you're, you're, you that the future generations are going to have a harder time. Uh, the, the climate issues are are part of the work of the bank, an important part. Uh, and so I want to mention the opportunity or as countries think about how to build back, uh, having a lower carbon uh, uh, footprint is an opportunity. We Oil prices are low now. It's a chance for people to change their systems and improve their systems so that they work better uh, in the future. And so that's one aspect of sustainability. Uh, but then an, another key aspect, we talked earlier about the transparency of the debt and investment practices that countries have, and that can make them more sustainable. And then there are many other aspects of this. One is the health systems. You need to have healthy people going forward after the pandemic, and that means systems that work uh, to provide vaccinations, to provide um, checking, ch uh, ch uh, child nutrition, and the checkups that children need, and all of the other aspects of that. Same with education, to create the uh, capacity in the future for businesses to spring up and skills to be available. One of the, interestingly, one of the most frequent uh, 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 questions that businesses asked, ask when they're thinking about investing in a developing country is what are the skills levels? They actually, the businesses want to hire people in the countries, but they want people that have language skills, that reading and writing skills, that have uh, skills with uh, uh, either with uh, the education system, with uh, uh, tools, with whatever the whatever the uh, kind of company is. They often say that the biggest constraint is the need for more skills by workers. So that's something that we can build strongly. Uh, at, as, as a way to get to faster growth in the future. Faster, sustainable growth is a core uh, mission of the, of the World Bank. I should mention that the, another core mention, uh, mission is the alleviation of extreme poverty. So I, I don't want to leave us on a down note, but I think we have to recognize the reality that with the world entering a severe recession, uh, one of the, there's, urgency in these tasks that I've talked about uh, uh, because um, the the uh, poverty levels are rising. It's the first time since 1998 uh, that was the Asian crisis. Uh, the first time now, again, that the poverty levels are going up instead of down, and that has severe consequences. So that drives the World Bank forward, and I hope drives the developing countries forward to create a better, stronger environment. David, thank you so much for taking the time today. And, and thank you. Good, good to talk with you. David Malpass is the president of the World Bank Group. He joined World Bank Live from his home in Washington, D.C. If you're not already, be sure to follow his updates on LinkedIn. But before we go, a big thank you to everyone who tuned in, commented, and shared this conversation with your followers, your friends, and your colleagues. We really appreciate that. If you'd like to watch it back or see it again or see any of the other conversations in our COVID-19 live series, head on over to live.worldbank.org. And if you'd like to learn more about the World Bank Group and its work, especially when it comes to fighting the coronavirus pandemic, head on over to worldbank.org forward slash coronavirus. Thank you again. Stay healthy. Stay safe. We'll see you back here again soon. Goodbye.